Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi, and I'm with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. And what we'd like to do today is to give you a little update on where we are with financing infrastructure and other things through the federal budget and what implications that have for the roads and streets in your area. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, bring up a, a few slides and then we're, uh, we're also joined by uh, Steve, Dr. Stephen Hubbard, who is going to talk about um, some of the implications and consequences of not having enough funding for the projects. And we're also joined by uh, Sam Forzik, a former executive from Amtrak, who's going to ask us some pertinent questions uh, to, uh, to better hone in on explaining where we are today. So I'm going to pull up a few slides um, to explain where we are. And uh, these slides want, uh, aim to give you a, a kind of a picture of where we are as of today, August 13th, 2021, in terms of financing our infrastructure projects through the federal budget. So there is a two track uh, approach going on now with the Biden administration and uh, um, some, with some Senate Republicans uh, to uh, finance infrastructure. Uh, we call that the Senate bipartisan bill. And uh, just recently, uh, the Senate approved that bill on August 10 to provide $550 billion of new money over the next five years. Most of it is for transportation, although there's some other money in there for the electric grid and broadband and a very small amount for water infrastructure, but nowhere near not enough. So that's the spending plan. Uh, paying for the plan has been the biggest uh, impediment or the biggest challenge uh, for legislators to agree upon. They have finally agreed to pay for about half of the plan by repurposing unspent coronavirus relief money and by tightening some reporting gains from cryptocurrency investments. But the CB, the C Congressional Budget Office reports that only half of the plan is paid for. So the rest will be through a deficit spending. Uh, the uh, plan currently uh, um, calls for, uh, has dropped the proposal for an infrastructure financing authority, although there's still some language in the bill that uh, uh, pushes uh, investments towards public-private partnerships. And Dr. Stephen Hubbard is gonna talk to you a little bit uh, about those in a minute. So as I said, the plan, uh, the Senate has approved this bill on August 10. It now goes to the House where it is waiting uh, in the House for an agreement on the second phase, which is the reconciliation package. Um, so this is the reconciliation package. It is a $3.5 trillion package uh, that, that the Democrats hope to pass with a simple majority uh, under reconciliation rules, uh, a simple majority of only Democrats on board. Um, and that package is, is composed of four, rolls together four things. The first is the uh, fiscal year 2022 budget that will pay for things like military spending and operations of the federal, other operations of the federal government and then our mandatory spending uh, for healthcare and social security. It will also roll together the, the baseline spending for infrastructure, uh, which is called reauthorization bills. Uh, every five years, the, uh, the budget proposes a new five-year plan for paying for um, transportation and water infrastructure. And we, we call that baseline spending. And that will be rolled together into this bill. In addition, it'll roll together the $1.8 trillion American Families Plan, which uh, I'll go into in a little bit. And then it will also extend the debt limit because we're spending every year more than we're bringing in a tax receipts. And our, uh, the, our raising of the debt limit had expired at the end of July, of this July. And so we need to raise it uh, for the next extended period. There is no money, however, in this, uh, this, this reconciliation package for high-speed rail and some other things that came out of the uh, earlier uh, infrastructure plan, but which Republicans and Democrats couldn't agree to in this plan. Uh, but specifically, there's no money in there for high-speed rail. So the framework has been uh, uh, published by Senator Sanders' budget committee, uh, which gives the whole outline for fiscal year 2020, uh, 22 in the next 10 years. 
Uh, it next goes to Senator Wyden's Finance Committee, uh, where it could run into a few snacks. Uh, there are the Republicans on that committee will certainly object to all of the large spending programs. And in addition, even some conservative Democrats on that committee, Senator Wyden among them, Senator uh, Warner and some others, uh, may object to, um, uh, to uh, how we finance this and the whatever deficit it will produce. So that's the, those are the two packages. They're on, on track, they're moving, uh, they're related to each other. One can't pass without the other. But even if both of them do pass, uh, we'll still uh, be four and a half trillion dollars short, uh, which I'll point out to you uh, just how that, how that looks. So uh, we are proposing, of course, a, a national infrastructure bank to top up all the spending, $5 trillion, for all these different categories. Uh, and we think that we need this bill in addition to whatever packages uh, the, uh, the Senate and the House managed to come up with. And here's essentially the reason why we need a $5 trillion bank. Uh, this, the American Society of Civil Engineers say that we have a funding gap that is after we account for uh, whatever baseline spending for infrastructure happens through the federal budget and whatever state and local budgets come up with out of their budgets, we still have this funding gap of $2.6 trillion over the next 10 years, which is not being addressed by this bipartisan plan. And in addition, we have added categories of our own that we think are really important hard infrastructure categories uh, for affordable housing, high speed rail uh, and large water projects. And of course, this broadband issue down here. Uh, so we will need at least $5 trillion. And if the current plans come up with only $550 billion over five years, uh, that will certainly not be enough to cover everything. And that will have huge implications because if we don't spend enough on infrastructure, then uh, as Stephen is going to point out to you, our infrastructure crumbles even faster and then we need more money later on to fix it. So uh, I wanted to say just a little bit uh, really quickly about this three, $3.5 trillion uh, budget, resolu budget resolution because uh, it gives you a picture of what uh, the whole plan looks like for the next 10 years out. Whenever you come up with a new uh, fiscal year uh, budget, you have to also forecast all your revenues and all your spending for the next 10 years out so that when the budget is being considered, uh, uh, legislators can consider what direction we're going in and whether we have enough money and what's happening also importantly to our overall debt limit. So I looked at the Sanders budget resolution for fiscal year 2022, and that has the forecast all the way out for the next 10 years. And then I did a simple calculation on what was year, uh, how did spending in the final year 2031 compare and grow from the first year 2022. And this is uh, what uh, these spending categories show. First of all, military spending is forecast to go up by another 15%, even though we're withdrawing out of Afghanistan, we're still putting money into military spending. The climate change pieces of infrastructure that were taken out of the earlier bill uh, and put into this bill uh, we're put in under the environmental category. Uh, they are expected to go up by 13%. That'll include things like charging stations and things like that. Transportation, surprisingly, this baseline transportation spending over the next 10 years is forecast to go down by, by 4%. Education will go up by 53%. That includes uh, new uh, uh, pre-K uh, uh, facilities and um, home, uh, home care facilities and also providing uh, tuition-free education for a two-year college degree. Health spending will go up. Medicaid will go way up uh, by 95% because um, Medicaid pro programs will be rolled into states that don't have them at uh, the current point in time. And then as an economist, I can tell you that the number that I always watch and look for carefully is the interest on our national debt. Um, we don't ever really pay back our national debt every year, but we must pay the interest on the debt. And the interest uh, is a function of how much debt do we have, and then where are interest rates going uh, into the future? Uh, the, this, uh, this budget forecasts that interest on the debt will go up by 174%. That'll be sucking up a lot of our revenues into the future that cannot then be going into uh, infrastructure and new transportation spending. Uh, and also the stock of the debt 
uh, whether it is from these any whether it's from the family plan as part of this or it's from the infrastructure bills as part of this any and, and or if it's from the health health uh, um, uh, the Medicare and Medicaid programs uh, whatever's causing it the stock of debt over the next 10 years is expected to rise by another 50 percent from 30 trillion up to 45 trillion and that will be sucking away a lot of our resources on paying for the debt meanwhile, we can have a national infrastructure bank that provides $5 trillion today for the next 10 years to meet all of our infrastructure needs and makes no calls on the federal budget for new taxes, deficit spending, or anything like that. And we can fix all of our infrastructure today. So good afternoon. My name is Dr. Stephen Hubbard. And I'm going to talk about uh, public-private partnerships and deferred maintenance. And let me get my slides up here. There we go. So. Uh, one of the features of the current uh, compromise legislation is that if there is a project, it first has to be offered to uh, out as a public-private partnership. And the problem with PPPs is that the basically the uh, the private parties need at least a 10 to 15 percent return on their investment. Otherwise, there's no reason to do it in the United States. They can get that offshore um, in many, many different countries. And the, the problem then also is that if there's if the um, partnership goes south and there is a problem with how the uh, project, whatever it is, uh, the infrastructure is being built, basically the government then picks up the tab. And so in a lot of cases, even though it looks these um, they look attractive at the start, uh, many large uh, PPPs have ended in failure with uh, massive lawsuits and then basically whatever the government agency is uh, picking up the tab. And as an example of why they, they just don't work well, there's the uh, Transportation Innovation Act, um, which basically uh, um, provides uh, money for transportation PPPs, and it has $70 billion sitting unused of federal funds, and there have been no rural programs indicating that there's just not a lot of infrastructure out there, at least in terms of transportation, that uh, PPPs will work in. And one of the reasons that, of course, there's a Brookings Institute study that found that 61% of the roads in the United States either break even or lose money. And so there's, there's just no way you're going to squeeze 15% of the profit out of the road segment that's losing money. Um, and also the other thing is, is that if you take a bridge or a tunnel that maybe you could make some money off of because it's a high traffic area and you turn that into a PPP and now there's a, a private agency that's making 15% profit on it, that was profit that you could have set up yourself with your own organization and uh, be using that then to subsidize portions of the transportation infrastructure or whatever uh, part of your infrastructure is that uh, doesn't make money. But now because you've turned that into a PPP, you're going to have to raise rates and uh, make up for that loss. As an example of how they just don't work, um, the EPA has two uh, um, circular uh, systems that uh, provide money that then can be paid back um, a state revolving fund. And um, even with those, uh, providing money. They're only 1.7% uh, of the country's 52,000 municipal water systems have been privatized. And uh, Food and Water Watch, when they've looked at what happens when you privatize um, water or sewer utilities and water, the average increase in cost is 33% for sewer at 60%. And Texas Power, of course, which recently was in the news with uh, the massive blackouts for two weeks and the loss of power and uh, water for 4.5 million families resulting in two to 700 deaths. Um, they pay 60% more for their power um, over the last uh, decade or so. So just not, it's a terrible deal overall, except in a few circumstances where um, there's a easy in and an easy out for the uh, privatization and the agency that, excuse me, the, um, the enterprise that's providing the um, funds. Um, so in terms of roads, what's wrong with roads is that, oh, excuse me, so I'm not going to jump to deferred maintenance. So this is a road condition from 100% here down to 5% here, which as you can see is falling apart, has that characteristic alligator look. And so what this is, is this is pavement condition, and this is time. And what happens is if you um, keep up with the maintenance on roads, then you, a road can last for 20 to 30 years. But if you withhold maintenance, the drop off is precipitous. And in just two to three years, the cost of repairing the road can go back up by a factor of four to a factor of 10 or more. And so um, this is 
uh, the problem with the current um, spending plan is it doesn't provide enough to cover the deferred maintenance. And just so you don't think that this is just in theory with a pretty picture, um, in 2008, over 530 of California's transportation agencies responsible for about 85% of the road network um, decided to pool their data because they were concerned about the state's road conditions. And it's an organization called Save California Streets. You can go find it on the web, safecaliforniastreets.org. Um, and basically they discovered after four years that the backlog, the amount of money it was going to take to put the state's roads and bridges into good repair wasn't 10 to $15 billion, which everyone was kind of assuming, it was actually $40 billion. And the cost was going to balloon to $66 billion in just 10 years. This is the exponential growth of deferred maintenance if you don't uh, take care of things all the time. And uh, as a result, they were finally able after 20 years to get an increase in their motor fuel taxes facing this literal, literally avalanche of uh, debt. So in terms of uh, the uh, compromise bill, so here this yellow area basically represents the uh, unfunded deficit of the United States in terms of transportation. This is, excuse me, infrastructure. And again, this is just to fix what's broken. This is not um, improving any, uh, excuse me, adding things in to keep up with foreign competition. And so that's the yellow area, somewhere between four and seven and a half trillion dollars. And up here, you see what PPPs will cover, the one to 2%. So you can see it's very small. Over here, we have um, essentially the compromise bill with $550 billion a year. Actually, you need to spend at least $125 billion to $200 billion a year to keep up with the deferred maintenance. Otherwise, your act, things are getting worse. And so it's a little bit like someone showing up to a sinking boat and say, hey, I have a bilge pump that'll run at 110 gallons per minute. And you say, great, we're taking on 125 to 200 gallons a minute. That's not going to help at all. We're still going to sink. And this is the problem. And this is why the $5 trillion infrastructure bank is needed. The two purple areas down here show what happens if the um, compromise bill is duplicated and, and it's, uh, it's essentially the same amount is extended over 10 years. You can see this little bit of coverage here, again, versus the total deficit. And again, this is just to fix what is broken, not keeping up with the competition like high-speed rail, 6G, one to two trillion for flying cars, high-speed freight or cybersecurity to protect ourselves from um, Russia and, and China and North Korea, somewhere between 200 billion and $1 trillion. And none of that is anywhere in the uh, current uh, funding. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stan Forsick. I'm a member of the advisory board of the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. And I am a retired executive from Amtrak working in both finance and infrastructure and also worked uh, for a consulting firm dealing uh, in the energy sector. Uh, I'm here to pose certain questions to both Alf Becca, who did an excellent job explaining the bank and other things, and Dr. Hubbard, who did a, a really great job explaining deferred maintenance and some of the other things that are on his slides. So I'd like to pose these questions. I'm gonna start with Alfeca. And Alfeca, you did an excellent job explaining where things are uh, between the two bills and what's going on uh, as we move forward. Again, these bills are just plans for infrastructure. And we've been, we've been watching this for almost a month now that the media is, that the news media is actually saying things that would lead the general public and a lot of political people at certain levels uh, in one direction. And it's not really going in direction, it's really a parallel type of arrangement. Could you take a moment or two and just explain uh, what's going to happen as we move forward. These are just plans, but eventually we want to get to the point of actually funding something or financing something. Could you out, outline what is going to be the steps and what is the coalition's expectation as we move forward? Thank you very much for your question, uh, Stan. Um, so the Bipartisan infrastructure plan has been converted from a plan into a bill. So that means that there are about 2,700 lines of legislation, uh, pages of legislation that map out uh, what, how, how the spending on infrastructure will proceed. That bill uh, is now um, finished with this in the Senate and has to go to the House 
but it cannot be passed in the House until the, um, the progressives are satisfied that they're going to get the second bill, which is the $3.5 billion of family plan with budget and with uh, baseline infrastructure spending. So the two are uh, um, dependent on each other, whether they pass is dependent. And the big bottom line is how much will all of it add to the debt and the deficit? And can it be funded or, and, and or how, can we reach agreement on how, to, on how to fund it, the plan going forward? If it adds to the deficit, we're gonna really need much more growth uh, to get us out of the debt hole, the debt trap that we're already in, lasting from COVID last year. Uh, so altogether, we still need, uh, we don't have enough in those plans. We definitely need an infrastructure bank to cover the rest of it. We don't have enough job creation and restructuring and growth in the economy coming from those plans. And a national infrastructure bank will really help with those things as well. So altogether, we're looking for an infrastructure plan, an infrastructure bank to complement those plans. They will not be enough. Thank you. Uh, also on your last slide, you presented uh, the um, uh, Sanders allocations of all the money in terms of percentages and you had the annual interest increase at, within the 10th year and you showed it as a percentage and also a dollar figure. It's over a trillion dollars. Uh, is there any way to stem that tide with what we've got on the table right now? The best way to, uh, to, to stem the tide of interest payments is to grow our way out of our debt. That's what happened the last time we had a national infrastructure bank, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, where we had, uh, because of the Great Depression and because of World War II spending, our debt level was way up here as a percentage of GDP. And then it came way down and now it's way back up again to where it was before. When it came down, it wasn't that we paid the debt back. It was that our economy grew so fast that we now had new tax receipts coming back into the budget to service the debt and made the debt actually smaller um, and in relation to the the bigness of things, which is the size of our economy that supports everything. And we can do the same, but we have to achieve higher uh, growth rates. And we cannot achieve higher growth rates with this budget alone. We really need a national infrastructure bank to finance all of our infrastructure, make our economy more efficient, solve our traffic congestion problems, move trucks faster, put people, people into great paying jobs, by the way, and uh, then those great paying jobs will have respending of their own, and then many more, much more in tax receipts will come back into the public coffers. And that's the big circle that makes uh, debt sustainable over the long run. But we must have growth and we must have an infrastructure bank that is adequate to the job to finance all of the infrastructure needs. Thank you again. I always get excited when you go through these things. There's always something new to learn. I have one more question for you. As we're talking about the National Infrastructure Bank and the bills and the politics involved with moving forward, states and cities that are proceeding with certain types of in, uh, infrastructure projects, for example, the electrification of bus services in cities and states. My question is, as these people proceed, because they're doing this now, they're going through their engineering process now. They're trying to figure out how to do it, what is the best method, methodology, and all those other things. Is there going to be a way that the National Infrastructure Bank, if approved, if created, and starts moving forward, can retroactively pay for some of those engineering uh, fees that are being used to make up this, these types of projects? Okay, uh, that's a great question on uh, how we deal with climate change overall, and specifically how we approach it from the uh, viewpoint of electrification of vehicles. Those, those entities should go ahead and start commencing with their electrification programs, but I can tell you that it will not be enough uh, for two reasons. First of all, we have to provide the electricity 
to these newly uh, electrified vehicles. So we need more transmission capacity. And we know on the electric grid, we have huge congestion problems and we have difficulty even with applications for new renewable energy projects to feed electricity to the grid. They're kind of backed up now. Uh, so one of the things that the bank will help with is to provide $80 billion for a new grid system that carries high voltage direct current electricity all across the United States, say from a cornfield in Oklahoma to an end user in Atlanta, Georgia, or to a bus depot in Atlanta, Georgia that's electrifying its buses. Uh, that's one of the things that we'll really need. Uh, in addition, don't forget, uh, buses are electric buses are great because they put lots of people into one vehicle and move very efficiently, uh, you know, transport people very efficiently. Uh, but in addition to that, we want to make sure that we solve our traffic congestion problems and electrifying vehicles electrifying cars per se will not be enough to do that. We need to have much more rail in our mix. What we know from a climate change point of view is that uh, um, hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbon emissions and CO2 emissions from transportation contributes 28% of our uh, emissions into the economy. Into the, into the atmosphere. So um, we want really to have more rail in our mix to move passengers and freight more effectively, get as many vehicles off of roads as we can to solve the traffic congestion problems and have a better transportation mix uh, that's more efficient. And what we know that is by, you know, by uh, since you're a former Amtrak official, is that we can use Amtrak, we can use commuter rail, we can use high speed rail uh, to move passengers, especially rush hour uh, commuter traffic, uh, much more effective, effect, effectively and efficiently. We have huge traffic congestion problems in the city of Philadelphia, in New York, around the Washington DC area, Atlanta, Georgia, Los Angeles, California. We need much more rail in the mix. And to have more rail in the mix, we need to finance it. And this bank will directly finance those projects. That was a great answer, but you did not mention, you did not address the oh, retro retroactively? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I think the fact that those projects are on the roll now uh, means that um, state, don't forget, states and local governments come up and transit authorities and so forth come up with plans for doing part of the transportation mix. And those plans are proceeding now. That's why we're seeing right. these, these, uh, these, uh, so that's, that's their contribution to the infrastructure financing plan. Uh, our part will be to pick up what's not being done. Uh, and so to have enough money to cover that $5 trillion worth of, of things that are not being done, uh, we'll, we'll be concentrating on that like uh, like Stephen said, on these um, roads that are not uh, economically uh, contributory uh, or, or less than contributory, um, getting, making sure that we have holistic systems in place. Uh, it's not enough just to build electric cars. We have all of these utilities underneath the roads that we need to fix as well. We have a big, huge infrastructure backlog. Uh, the engineers and their report card did a great job in pointing to the nature of all these things. And we need to have a bank that is able to cover all of it. So electrification of vehicles will be something, maybe not retroactively, but it'll support a whole system that is uh, making our transportation more efficient and less CO2 generating. Excellent. One of the things Thank the uh, bank can do is it can, um, an agency, if they have debt that is at a higher rate than one of the NIB loans, they can apply for a loan. And essentially, you know, there's no, the pro if the project is already uh, built, then there's far less risk involved, especially also if they have user fees. And so they can apply and the loan can be um, paid off and then replaced with much lower cost debt. So that's one of the things the bank can do. Thank you. We're gonna move from Alfeca and we're gonna to go to uh, Dr. Stephen Hubbard. And I'm gonna ask him a few questions regarding some of his points in his presentation, which I thought was an excellent presentation as it always is. But I want to ask you if you could get a little further in depth explanation uh, on the figures that you cite as the annual cost of deferring maintenance. And does the figure accelerate 
as each year goes by. Right. So this is one of the, the large unknowns. The way I derived that figure is that I looked at the categories that were not included in the uh, ASCE's estimate in addition to what was there. And I, well, actually, at first I talked with the ASCE and asked them if they included deferred maintenance in their estimates, and the answer was no. So in other words, they're just looking at a snapshot of what's needed, not as it increases over time. And actually, I started when their um, estimate was at 1.9, and at that point, I had somewhere above uh, 50 billion dollars a year. And if you sort of like, if I followed it along, I pretty much was uh, spot on in my uh, my estimate of what the annual increase was, because they're now at 2.6. Um, but what I did is I used several states that had comprehensive um, statewide infrastructure backlog estimates. And then I scaled them to the United States and included things that were left out. And that's where I came up with the 125 to $200 billion a year. And uh, the answer is yes, it does um, accelerate. And so there's a slide I didn't show, but it basically there's a, a, a rule called de Sitter's Law of Five. He's a, a famous um, civil engineer. I think he's passed away. But if you look up on the web, you get someone who's involved with relativity. And this is because his dad was a contemporary of Einstein and did a lot of uh, fundamental work in cosmology. So in any case, if you put in de Sitter and put in concrete, you'll discover he, after 25 years, he came up with this rule of thumb, which is that basically if you withhold um, uh, maintenance on reinforced concrete, what happens is little cracks go down to the rebar, the rebar rusts and then expands. And if you've ever been walking along on a sidewalk, you'll see there's a divot missing and you'll look down and there's a piece of rebar and you think, huh, why did that happen? And that's because the rust expands and it cracks the concrete. So what happens is when you start withholding maintenance and start stop repairing those little cracks, because you're going to use austerity and you're going to save, say, 2% a year, you know, because that's basically what the interest rate is right now on T-bills. And uh, that's going to help um, reduce the cost of infrastructure. His rule is basically every five years, the money that you withheld is multiplied by a factor of five. So whatever you've, if you withheld $1, just to make it easy, after five years, you've actually wasted $5. And after 10 years, it uh, goes five times five, it's now $25 that you've wasted for that, those few dollars saved. And after 15 years, if you thought you saved $15, it's now 125 times that amount. And you're probably, you've lost your asset, it's failed. Um, or the cost of repairing it will essentially be the, the cost of a new one. And so this is where, and this, this is basically multiplied across all of um, the US infrastructure, whether it's um, uh, power poles or uh, 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 sewer systems or water systems, everything grows exponentially, whereas the savings occurs at a very, very small rate. And what happens is, is that amount is broadcast by the austerity proponents is like, look at the money we save, and you see it in annual reports. And then the enormous um, loss in terms of increased maintenance is reported elsewhere, and the two are almost never tied together. And so it always looks like austerity is saving you money. In reality, a good rule of thumb is it weighs somewhere between two and four dollars for every dollar that's reported saved. Thank you. Can we, let's go back a couple sentences and uh, in, in what you were just talking about and sort of uh, see if we can get a crystal ball in front of you on your desk. You mentioned the five time or, or the five dollars to one dollar as we move forward. Uh, it, it's an add on to a project cost. And if that's what it is, if we defer uh, four trillion dollars because we, we well four and a half trillion dollars because we're only going to do that five hundred and fifty. What is that cost really going to be, including the deferred maintenance, let's say five years from now, when nothing's been done but those projects? I, I would, again, use sort of like the standard thing. So if I defer a trillion dollars, I would say in five years that that's going to cost me somewhere between 500 billion and say uh, $2 trillion. Um, and that's a conservative estimate. One of the things that could easily be done is the government could, the, um, in California, where I talked about Save California Streets, the uh, US government could easily for you know 10 to $20 million set up a similar system um, across the entire United States. It's just starting out, if nothing else, with transportation. 
um, where agencies would log in, put in what their, their current deferred maintenance backlog estimates are and their capital projections for one, two, four, eight, and 16 years out. And after about three to four months, you'd have enough data to say whether which view is correct. The U.S. deficit is really small, or the U.S. Def infrastructure deficit is is more on the order of what we're talking about, and it could be done very simply. And then that would simple that would end the the argument over whether it's small or large. Because right now, when you have two groups that are apart by multi-trillion dollars, it's really hard, as you've seen, to get any kind of coherent policy put together. Because you it's like trying to put out a fire. You don't know whether you need to show up with ten fire companies or a bucket, and uh, that's the problem that the uh, you know, we're facing right now, and there's a very simple solution to do that. But I would say that you're looking at over five years, somewhere between a half a trillion to several trillion dollars. But that's also, in a certain way, the tip of the iceberg, because there are many things that aren't in there. And so, for instance, I talked briefly about cybersecurity. And um, we, we've just learned recently from the Chinese, the North Koreans, and the Russians, they've schooled us that they can almost shut down parts of our infrastructure at will. And two, this means with the internet of things that every chip and computer that's connected now to the internet has to be basically tested like, you know, um, underwriters laboratory, but of course, to a much higher degree to make sure that there are no back doors because it was a foreign chip and that was put in, built into the chip, buried in it somewhere, or um, it's got either firmware or software that's got a vulnerability in it that can be exploited because the government has basically had the um, Russians walk through it for almost a year, um, there are various agencies, including Department of Treasury, um, because of uh, solar winds had a vulnerability in one of their uh, in, uh, internet uh, switches. And this was then exploited. And so what happens is the basically the cyber barrier, if you will, if you want to use a medieval castle as a, a visual um, analogy, is that basically uh, we don't know where the holes are. And it's easy for our, excuse me, and also the total security of the whole castle is only as good as um, all of the walls put together, including all of those for all of the uh, little castles around, which you can think of as contractors and things. And so basically, um, this is an enormous cost that's not uh, anywhere in uh, uh, any of the uh, uh, bills so far and could lead to you know, the, the actual uh, economic uh, catastrophe if someone decides to start shutting down large portions of our economy. So rusting pipes is just a small portion of the problem that we're facing right now. We need a comprehensive uh, approach to it, not not nickel and dime, which is, I'm afraid to say, what we're doing right now. So if, if I took the last part of, of that sentence, and we've talked about this on several occasions, uh, and I think in one of our previous discussions, you were talking in terms of closer to seven trillion, eight trillion dollars is really the infrastructure price tag. Now, does that include this resilience resiliency factor that we just spoke about? As far no. as no. does not does, does not include reshoring um, um, all of the companies that have been offshored over the last twenty years with the glo globalization uh, rush where everything was now being made offshore and that seemed really great. But as any military man could would tell you, you know, when you have basically long supply lines, they're all very vulnerable. And so what we discovered was it wasn't a war, but basically COVID shut down production overseas, companies that countries that were making reagents that were critically needed for basically making the shots and other things or uh, masks, PPP, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, personal protection. Uh, medical protection and all that, all of those things were all kept on shore at the foreign countries. And so we have to reshore um, several trillion dollars worth of uh, manufacturing, which has all been decimated. So none of that is any of these estimates. And so this is why the, the $5 trillion bank may even be too small. And what happens is the numbers get so large, people just tune them out and they say, right. well, it's just too large for me to think about. Um, I'm glad we've got this little bipartisan bill. Now I can feel good. And in reality, it's it's like grabbing onto a little piece of melting ice in the middle of the ocean. And it's, right. <laughs> it's, right. doesn't, it doesn't give me a very secure feeling. That's why I was I mentioned that uh, in Alfeca's question about how the media portrays certain things and people grab onto it and they really don't understand. So it sounds when we talk to you and Alfeca 
that there is a very serious problem as we move forward if things don't get approved. And there's also a serious problem that we might be short uh, in our estimates for uh, infrastructure. So each yeah, of you, me, I'd I'll, like I'll, to I'll, Oh, sorry, let me just add, add, sure, let me just add something. So I'm, I'm a student of World War II and the Depression. So um, uh, General Wiedemeyer uh, put together a, a plan called the Victory Plan. Um, and I, th um, I think he was uh, um, a colonel at the time um, that basically mapped out everything that was needed to win World War II. And it caused gasps because the number of planes and tanks were just you know, and sometimes 10 times what people thought was going to be needed. And he had been actually uh, a student at the Wehrmacht and learned uh, German battle tactics and knew exactly what was going to be needed to defeat um, the Axis, so to speak. And so we need the equivalent of a victory plan. And so you've heard Alfeca and I tossing these huge numbers around. Um, we're not saying absolutely that these numbers are perfectly correct, but what there should be is it should should create a sense of alarm in our elected officials, and they should work on putting together a victory plan for the United States, which actually maps out, goes out and assesses what is the actual need. Do we really need several trillion dollars to fix the roads in the United States, or maybe is it only two or three hundred billion, and then the amount of money is there? The numbers aren't would not be hard to come by. It would only take six months to go out and do this kind of assessment. And then we would actually know what it is we need to basically make the United States whole and be secure and compete internationally. And we don't have that information right now. And there's no reason not to do it. I hope I'd, I'd add on to that, Stan, too. Don't forget, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this infrastructure bank plan has a Buy America only provision in it. And that will make sure that all the inputs into construction are made in America and start a new manufacturing base for our country and something to build upon where we can do our we can do our own computer chips here. We can make our own steel here. We can uh, uh, use uh, uh, cement in construction, the CO2 sequestering cement. We can train people in 21st century technologies. All of this can be done with our bank, but we need to have a bank to make it happen. I agree with both of you. I, the, the situation is such that we're looking at things that were outside the Beltway and the people inside the Beltway really don't have a clue. I've got one question I wanna pose to both of you. And it's, it's, uh, it's a hypothetical question, but really need, need, needs to be brought up from the standpoint that uh, the people need to know exactly what your thoughts would be in this area. And I want you to think about the future and, and use your individual uh, crystal balls. And from an economic point of view, give some insight as to where the U.S. could will go financially and economically if we do nothing to improve the majority of the infrastructure in this country. So I'm an economist and I always like uh, economic modeling. Uh, actually, the American Society of Civil Engineers went to my favorite modeler, the University of Maryland, and said, throw all this stuff into the model, uh, all this new spending, and tell me what are the what what is the economic impact for, for America? And it's truly, truly amazing. I mean, we can get our growth rates up to the five percent level um, with this with it, such an infrastructure package. We can make our economy more productive. Uh, trucks will move faster. Um, we'll, we'll be able to increase um, disposable income for the average American worker because they'll have a great new job and we'll have many more, much more tax receipts coming in to federal and state and local coffers. This is really good news from an economic point of view. But if we don't do it, our economy goes backwards. So it really is time for us to step up and say, let's have a new bold vision and a new bold plan and really get the job done. And this will not co cost the federal uh, budget and the, uh, any more deficit spending or taxes. It's an easy fix. We've done it four times before in our nation's past. It worked great every time, built most of our infrastructure. And this was the mechanism that paid uh, for World War II and the manufacturing base uh, that, that set us on uh, to be one of the greatest manufacturers in the world. And we need to return to that model today. Dr. Hubbard? Um, one of the things I see um, occurring is 
a lot of times people look backwards as they think sort of like, what do I need in the future? And the, the recent past is used as the model. And so what's happening is that the, everyone who's saying we need to balance the budget and use PAYGO to go forward because the deficits are so large is thinking, well, we're, you know, growth is, as Alfeca is just saying, is up, you know, and, and you know, three, four, five, six percent, sort of the golden era after World War II, when we basically built everything that we have today, and we uh, reap the benefits for every dollar that was spent on the federal highway system, I think approximately four to seven dollars were returned back to the economy. So in other words, if you used a dollar's worth of tax money, you got four to seven dollars in taxes back over, over time. And so what's happened instead is, is um, income inequality has uh, shifted money to the wealthy and then they invested offshore is more and more of the money that used to be kept at home to keep um, the United States first in the world is now going offshore to build factories and then those goods come on shore. So we've lost the jobs and we've lost the tax revenue. And so now when you look at our failing economy, or excuse me, infrastructure, we used to be first in the world in the 60s. We're now somewhere between 13th and 19th heading towards 24th, which is where we are in some studies. And so this basically means that if you use PAYGO, that we've, the country has been put into what's no, known as a graveyard spiral. So pilots that get lost in clouds uh, bank to the left and um, accelerate down into a corkscrew until they hit the ground and they're never able to recover. And essentially this is what's happened to the economy. It's been put into a graveyard spiral where more and more money goes offshore to build factories. There's no um, tax revenue. Our infrastructure begins to degrade further. As you see, it's, saw it's an exponential rate, just like that plane accelerating towards the ground. And so unless we pull back on the stick and apply some gas, we're not going to, things are not going to end well. And so I echo Afeka's comments, which is we need to basically spend our power our way out of the graveyard spiral we're in. If we pull back on the engines, pull back on the throttle and grip the stick more tightly where the ground is gonna rush up at us faster and faster and it's not going to end well. Well, thank you. I thought this was a great session. Uh, you really uh, answered the questions. I, I, I'm sorry I couldn't come up with more, but I think for the next time I will. I would suggest those that are watching to think about this and, re and just imagine, okay, as Alfeca said, the last National Infrastructure Bank came to term in 1957. Imagine and thinking about what they just said about the economics and financial conditions if we don't do anything. Imagine if that bank did not end in 1957, where we would be today. We wouldn't have to have these conversations and everything would be running smoothly insofar as infrastructure is concerned and would take the polit political fighting that is involved with all of this out. Members of the coalition appreciate the time that you've put in watching this small video. I hope you got something out of it, and I hope you got a certain amount of clarification uh, as to what we've been talking about, and we will do this again. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.